And uh, welcome back to the first This Week in Crowdfunding episode of 2024. And we have two amazing guests, again, Woody and Yvonne. Thank you for joining me and Brendan. We appreciate it. And we are excited to hear about the exclusive, uh, you know, crowdfunding industry insights that y'all have to sh show us kind of to map out how we expect this uh, this show to go. We're going to start with looking back and recapping December, and then we're going to kind of compare the year to year and then look at uh, some insights, some trends that we think are going to take place in 2024. But with that being said, Woody and Yvonne, thank you for coming on. Thanks, guys. Great to be with you again. And you know, great to dig into some of this. Um, the uh, How are we getting the presentation up? Yvonne, did you send that to uh, Brendan? Did you send it over to uh, to either of them, uh, Woody? Um, I sent it to you. <laughs> That's why I was just oh, laughing. Oh, sorry about that. All right, why, why don't you why don't you get going, Woody? So I'll resend it to you guys and uh, Yvonne, uh, send it to uh, me and, and I'll pull it up. And then uh, Woody, why don't you introduce uh, us to? Why not? Yeah, I think it's, so. Why, why we're waiting for the deck to show up on the screen? Don't worry, guys. There's plenty to say about the backdrop to what's happening in crowdfunding. So, um, you know, people are raising capital online, but this is all happening through what's happening, you know, behind the scenes, you've got, you know, macroeconomic geopolitical <coughs> events that are taking place. So it behooves us to talk a little bit about those. In December, we saw that the Fed was gonna hold the interest rates uh, where they were, which is at a high point. Um, they're, waiting, they're seeing stabilization in core inflation. Um, and because of that stabilization, we're seeing a, uh, what they said was a signal for a drop in interest rates. Uh, they actually um, put three out there, they said, potentially for 2024. Of course, all of this is dependent upon whether or not we get core inflation down to where the Fed wants it. And, you know, something else doesn't happen in the marketplace um, that um, forces the Fed to do something different. Uh, of course, if we enter a recession, that changes everything. And of course, those interest rates will drop. Um, our economy is still strong. Uh, job growth and wage um, gain is slowing, which is another positive sign that the Fed is happy about. Uh, we've seen unemployment claims rising. Now, that might sound like a bad thing, but from the Fed's perspective, they like that because it does mean that it's a cooling marketplace, uh, which means that people are going to be spending less as well, and that's what they're looking for. And um, we're seeing you know, the war in Ukraine and the Middle East really take center stage. Um, oil prices have declined um, over the past month, which has been good for consumers. Um, uh, however, there's been some issues with um, shipping, um, with uh, the supply chain worries that are happening in the Red Sea. Um, and so all of that is sort of, you know, weighing on investors like, you know, should I be investing in the marketplace? Is something going to happen? If you look at what happened in the markets, um, that Dow ended on a high for the year. Um, people are confident that the economy is moving in the right direction and inflation is coming down. Uh, so there's been exuberance in the marketplace. And I would say that type of exuberance sort of jumped on over to the investment crowdfunding marketplace where um, we didn't have, you know, a record number of issuers, um, but we did see dollar amounts increase, not to the same amount as November. Um, and we did see uh, more investors write checks in December as well. Um, so I can jump in and start talking about those data points as well. Um, have you Woody, I, I do have a quick question just before we start. It's just out of curiosity, but have you, is, is there any sort of connection between how the market does and what you see in the crowdfunding industry? You know, that's a good point. So the correlation is there in the sense that if the markets are are reacting positively, investment crowdfunding tends to have a good month. Okay. Um, and if the markets are running negative, then that investor sentiment and fear trickles down to investment crowdfunding as well. The only time there was a disconnect between that was during the pandemic. And I think what happened during the pandemic was, even though the markets sort of crashed and stabilized um, and went back up, people were in front of their computers because we all were working at our homes. Mm -hmm. And so what we saw were more offerings by issuers coming online that needed capital or else they were going to go out of business. And the, many of these were local businesses where local investors were like, I love this company. 
and I don't want to see them go out of business. And so that's why 2020 you know, and 2021 were such exceptional years in terms of capital formation for investment crowdfunding, because um, there was, you know, this sort of everyone coming in to support people. So, you know, the correlation is there, I think, when things are good, but, you know, otherwise, you know, I think it's not, you know, always 100% correlated. Yep, that makes sense. And then it's also still important to note that it's an incredibly young industry. So, you know, there's, there's not going to be a direct correlation. I just think it's going to be interesting watching the industry progress in the future years and seeing kind of if it becomes more connected to the market or less connected to the market. Yeah, totally. Um, so we can go on to the next slide. Who's in control of that? Not I. Do you guys see the slide? Yep, yep, we see it. Oh, there we go. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay, so in December, we had 131 new deals. Um, that was down from 139 in November, but up from 115 last year. So, so what does all that mean? Well, you know, I've been talking a lot about how with the macroeconomic conditions, I believe that there were many issuers that are trying to time the marketplace and we're thinking, maybe now is not the right time for me to be entering that marketplace. So if you look at the chart that's in below all the wording there, and there's a line, uh, you know, a vertical line on the right hand side, that's where 2023 begins. So if you just look at that, you can see what I believe is this issue or sentiment, which is that pullback, like I don't it, but it starts to change, you know, halfway through the year, when we start to see a lot of what's happening in the public markets, I think, you know, we saw this inflation getting under control and all that stuff. And so we're seeing more issuers come into the marketplace. So that's clearly up from, you know, what was happening last year, which is when hyperinflation was happening and people were very concerned about, you know, you know, is this the right time for me to be doing anything? You know, the cost of running a business are just going to be that much higher. So maybe I should just hold off on doing my offering. I think we're now moving out of that. And I think that's what this chart at the bottom is showing you particularly on the right hand side, which is, you know, for the past few um, months, we've seen an uptick in these offerings, these new deals that are happening. Um, and I think that's going to continue. So overall, when you look at what happened in 2023, the total new deals was 1,464. That's down from 1,588 that was in 2022, but I think 2024 is going to be much higher than that. We saw, you know, when you dig down into where is this activity happening, um, we look at the change in the number of deals in cities all across the country. And one of the things that we're working on right now is this genome project where we're sort of grouping cities together. So Denver and Boulder, yeah, we're separated by 20 miles, but this is really, you know, sort of a collective enterprise of cities that have businesses that raise capital. Um, and that in itself is like a genome part. Um, but if we just break it down by cities, you can see places like Wilmington, Delaware, Chicago, and Atlanta really are seeing an uptick in offerings, which I think is great because that speaks to the democratization that we were hoping that this would have. Um, but what's been fascinating as well is we've seen the drop. And again, it's been about a 30% drop in new deals in New York, San Francisco, and LA. So major epicenters um, where we're seeing fewer offerings keep in mind that's fewer offerings, but still the majority of these offerings take place in New York City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, you know, Florida, uh, Miami, because, you know, there's such an epicenter of people there. So, you know, it makes sense. The more people you have, the more opportunities there are. Um, you know, we've had over 500 uh, industries that have been funded. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing is sort of aggregating these companies into new industry groups to make a little more sense. Uh, we're seeing within those groups that you've got uh, a jump in clean tech deals and healthcare. Restaurants have had seen a, a seemingly great uh, time this year, um, but we've seen a drop in you know, the software and the finance and the media type of offerings as well. So um, what I like about this is I don't care with, if there's been a jump or a drop, I like the fact that we're seeing investments happen in from all sorts of industries because it proves that you just don't have to be, you know, a restaurant to raise capital. You can, you know, I mean, the fact that we have some of these, you know, clean tech companies um, raising capital, which are capital intensive businesses, 
I speak, I think speaks volume to the opportunity for both issuers that are want to come in and build a proof of concept or investors that want to get in on something where they, you know, maybe they've got industry seeing the technology, they believe in the entrepreneurs and they want to get behind it. Woody, um, Woody can I double click think... on something? Yeah. So uh, I just want to go back to the geography thing. And I know we talked about this a little bit at length uh, on the last episode, but um, I sent Connor an article today from the Wall Street yeah. Journal. Uh, I apologize. I have a puppy at home now. But um, uh, basically what the article was saying is that start the people that are starting startups, entrepreneurs, people looking to raise capital are going to these cities, especially Atlanta, because it's cheaper to live and it's cheaper to raise a family. So they have more opportunity to take a risk rather than living in a Silicon Valley like San Francisco or living in a big city like New York or Boston. So I think that this is, that's just another kind of aspect of the whole geography part of crowdfunding that I took a little bit of perspective on today. I think it's a great point. You know, if you're living in, in Seattle or Silicon Valley or San Francisco, New York City, you're paying an arm and leg just for rent. Um, so starting a business is not the easiest thing to do in any of those cities. So if you've got an idea for a business um, and it's not necessary to be located in those cities, yeah, moving to one of these cities um, is a great idea. I mean, you know, that's what brought us to Denver, um, you know, because it was much more affordable and, you know, it's easier to, to, to you know, for cost of living and everything. So, you know, to do that here. So it, it makes sense that if people are moving to these cities for lower cost of living and all this stuff, it's a great place to raise capital for your business because you'll be able to operate it, you know, with less cost. Okay. Um, the, uh, in December, wait, actually go back to that for a second. There's a couple of points I want to hit on. Um, in December, 40.8% of the deals had at least one woman or minority founder. Um, you know, I, I hit on this all the time. If you look at what happens in Silicon Valley, these venture capital firms, they are trying to hire, uh, not hire, they're trying, they, they can't fund um, uh, women and minority entrepreneurs, mainly because I don't think it's easy for them to find these entrepreneurs. Um, and so if they can't find them, they can, of course, invest in them. Of course, then there's the bias of, uh, where it's a white boys club. Um, and so if you're not white and if you're not a boy, then you're not really going to get financing in Silicon Valley. So the fact that you can just go online uh, and if you're a woman or minority, uh, put an offering up there and raise capital from your community, which mainly looks like you, uh, I think speaks volume to the opportunity that's built into investment crowdfunding. So I love the fact that we're constantly seeing about 40% of these offering have a woman and minority founder. You know, I think at the beginning of the year it was less. We're seeing that number go up and up over time. So, you know, maybe it'll just be, you know, another year or so between 50, now 50% of the deals have women and minority founders. You know, we're still have to work on the capital. Um, it's not, you know, one-to-one, -one. um, women and minority founders do, um, raise less on average than their white male counterparts, but I think the the parity is possible. Um, and I think it's, uh, we're getting close to it. Um, in December, there was a bit of a drop off in the number of deals that have, have VC participation. So when an issuer, um, launches their deal, we look to see if there's any venture capital that has backed the deal already. Um, because we think that's a tremendous signal. If they've already come in, they've already put their money where their mouth is, they've done a, a layer of diligence that you're really not going to see the crowd do. It's possible that the crowd could do, but you know, VCs coming in a deal are going to do a much different layer of diligence than your average investor. Um, we see that 8.3% uh, of the deals had venture capital. So, I, you know, again, I, you know, I, five years ago, that was 0%. Um, so the fact that this is more and more happening in the space I think speaks volume to the opportunity for the industry, for the opportunity for investors that want to get into deals side by side with venture capital. And I mean, you guys might want to talk about this. Um, you know, how often do retail investors, your average Joe, have the opportunity to invest alongside a venture capital firm? Never. Exactly. So if this then uh, sort of levels the playing field where we can do this, I think that creates a tremendous opportunity for uh, retail investors 
to have that same sort of upside that these venture capital um, are hoping for. Um, the next point, 16.8% um, of the deals in December were follow-on rounds. Uh, so what a follow-on round is essentially an issuer that's done one round online, comes back and does another round online. Um, I think there were 23 issuers um, that month that had done uh, a follow-on round. There were a handful that had already done five investment crowdfunding rounds online, if you can believe it. One of them is in December had done six. So that says something in itself. Like these, these issuers are perfectly content just going online, raising up to $5 million a year. And if they hit that, they can wait the next year and you know, do another 5 million, but raising it from their community. And I think there's something behind that because it's not just the capital that they're raising, but it's the, uh, the marketing voice that they're getting from these investors. Um, Listen, I invest in, in many of these deals. You know, I also do it through our venture arm, D3DC. But, you know, even before that, I've been investing in these deals. And I sit around with my friends and I'm like, I just invested in this coolest company. You know, you know, there's, you know, women are minority founders. I always talk about that. Um, but I always talk about the innovation that's taking place and why I think it's cool. And I'm, I look at things that, you know, VCs do as, as well. I look to see if they've got revenue. I look to see if they've had an exit before, if they've raised capital before. Those are all signals to me. Um, you know, so I think there's a lot of this that's happening in terms of these follow-on rounds where these investors are becoming brand advocates for these issuers itself. The, um, we look at the offerings from when they file with the SEC to when they have a deadline to close their, their offering. It's very different from a Reg D type of offering where you um, go out and you are raising capital for a year. You know, it's just you're just raising money. Um, in crowdfunding, there's a definitive date. Like you've got to end this offering at a certain date. You can extend it, of course, by filing forms with the SEC. But the average length of these offerings is about 110 days. I think that's phenomenal. Um, it's down from 140 last year, so that means that issuers are getting their capital much sooner than they were a year ago. That means they can put it to work faster. That means they can do achieve their goals um, much faster. And I, I think that's great. So, you know, I don't know if the average length is something that's going to continue to go down. I think one of the reasons why we've seen this drop is, again, where economic uncertainty exists, um, that creates um, sort of fear. Um, and I think issuers that are seeing in an economy that, you know, where they might be wondering what's going to happen, might want to have a deadline be sooner where they're like, I just want to get the capital so I can get going, rather than risk staying open. Because investors in regulation crowdfunding have up to two days before the offering closes to pull out their investment. So you want to make sure that if you're one of these issuers that, you know, it's not open too long. These, these offerings do get stale. I mean, if you have it open too long, Investors can pull out because they're like, well, you're not even doing anything with you know, the money you're supposed to be getting started. So I'm not sure what's going to happen in 2024 with that. But, you know, I, I'd like to see that this, this average window is about four months long. Um, Woody, other, do you? Yes. Uh, sorry, but do you see the day's average length as uh, almost like a fund velocity where it's these founders are being able to raise the same amount of money, but just in a shorter window, which either indicates that there's better startups that are more appealing for the investors or that there's more investors that are eager to put their money to work? I think it's probably a combination of the two, but more of the first one that you said. Um, and that goes to the next point, which is 65.7% of issuers are post revenue. Um, so the type of companies that have come into the marketplace has fundamentally shifted since, since the industry launched in 2016, where 65% of the issuers are startups and zero you know revenue just less than three years old um so to your point i think you've got these more established companies that are in place they know what they need their money for um they know how much they need and they want to they want to get close on it to, to really put it to use um and i think that's maybe what could be leading it i do think there's more investors coming into the marketplace but here's the tricky part of that I think that um, these investors have some sort of relationship to these issuers. So be it they're a friend or family, a follower, the businesses in their community and the local newspaper wrote about it, everybody knows the business or something, and they just wanna be a part of it. So I think that drives new investors into the marketplace. 
Um, but I do believe there's this network effect where you're on these platforms like WeFinder, StartEngine, um, such a mass amount of investors now, they do marketing for offerings on their platform. And I think that awareness with investors that have invested in a deal, but I think it leads to people sharing information about these companies as an opportunity for other people to invest. I mean, I just did it this morning with uh, my best friend, Patrick, where I forwarded on a deal to him. I was just like, this one's right up your alley. Um, and he's never invested in the crowdfunding deal before. Um, so I think that's how you get more people engaged in it. So Patrick, if you're listening, that was a shout out to you. <laughs> well, that's also awesome too, that you can get your friends to invest in the startups because of this crowdfunding industry, which is another highlight. And, you know, it's like, uh, you can invest alongside VCs like we talked about earlier. You can also invest with your friends too in these startups that you see a lot of potential or you think is a great deal. Totally, yeah. Um, so when you add up all these uh, new deals, we've got about almost 8,000 offerings to date. So I think we're, we're moving in the right trajectory according to that um, average uh, trend line up there. So we, now we can go on to the next slide. Okay, investments in December were at 43.9 million of committed capital. Um, that was up from the prior year, but down from November. November had like 54, $55 million in committed capital. I'm not surprised that there was a contraction in the amount of capital. I mean, what's happening in December? Christmas, uh, you know, the holidays. Everybody's, you know, buying presents. So, you know, I'm not necessarily expecting people to be investing their money into the capital markets. But what was interesting about this is that this was the strongest December on record for investment crowdfunding. Uh, December tends to be a very, you know, a lower month when you look at the, the seasonality of what's happening. So the, the fact that there was 43.9 million in there, I think, is, is a strong indicator, again, that investors are looking at this as an opportunity and putting more capital into it. Um, the um, total amount that's been raised in 2023, uh, we ended at 547.2 million. That was up from a little over 500 million or a half billion in uh, 2022. Um, yay, you know, you know, I talked about this before, you know, the first billion that we raised in investment crowdfunding took five years to accomplish. The second billion took 18 months. Um, if we're on this track record, it looks like the third billion is probably going to be around 12, 13 months. Um, that's what we want to see, more capital, more velocity of capital coming in. Um, investors are taking greater risks, but when you look at the chart below, um, you can see that 2021, again, when we were talking about that pandemic effect, um, really had the most capital in there. The hyperinflation that took place in 2022 that scared people out of the market saw that contraction take place, but now we're sort of coming back again in 2023. Um, and I think 2024 is going to be another, uh, you know, a great year, maybe, a, you know, the best year for crowdfunding to date. Um, I think it's really important that you, you know, crowdfunding isn't just, you know, startups. As I, I was talking about before, you've got these post-revenue established businesses. Um, so you have to look at the, you have to dig into the data. I think that's like the most important thing is you can't just look at the entire data set because that gives you an Idea of how things are going, but you really have to dig into it to see what's happening within these companies. And I always like to focus on who are the companies that are these unicorns in the space? You know, who's raising a million dollars? Because raising a million dollars is not an easy feat. Um, and in December, there were 11 issuers that closed over a million dollars. Wow. So that's, you know, that's pretty impressive that 11 companies were able to raise a million dollars. And they're not raising it from a handful of people. Usually these offerings have about <clears throat> two to 500 investors in it. So there's quite a few investors that are in these deals. So that takes quite a bit of effort in order to get the awareness out there to those people. And collectively, the industry has raised about $2.2 billion to date. So we can move on to the next slide. Yeah, yeah, Woody. I have a, I have a question here for you, uh, out of left field. Uh, so don't be don't be scared here. But I'm just looking at uh, the industry. Um, you know, 2016 started a little bit up, but nothing happens for a couple of years, and then obviously 2020 and beyond, we have this massive growth, right? Obviously, we know why. It's COVID. People are at home, have excess cash, 
why not this is something new great that's that's the big driver there and then we stay at this high level do you see what do you see other than another you know pandemic what else could be out there that could lead this to have another step change to another higher level right is there is there something that you're thinking about that you think could from the regulatory perspective or from somewhere out of left field something that you're seeing that could change that picture dramatically other than just normal chugging along and going higher as we go <clears throat> a couple things um that's a great question so between 2016 if you look at our chart and 2020 there was one variable within investment crowdfunding that stayed the same and that was the maximum the issuers could raise it was one million dollars in 2021, the SEC moved that from 1 million to 5 million. So if you look at the chart, what happened in 2021? Everything jumped up. Mm. I think now that we've proven that, you know, more established, less risky companies are coming into the marketplace, the longevity of these companies is there. I mean, one of the things that we've just done a research project on was looking at, at the companies that have raised money in crowdfunding. Are they still in business? only 17.53% of companies that have been successful with a crowdfunding offering are no longer in business. And that goes all the way back to 2016. So we're doing better than the Bureau, Bureau of Labor and Statistics states about the average company, which goes out of business in, within five years, 50% of them will go out of business. Um, so I want, I think there's an opportunity for us to go back to Washington, go back to the SEC, go back to Congress and say, you know, we've, there's relatively no fraud in this marketplace. Why? Because it's a lot easier to commit fraud where you don't have to do all these disclosures, put all this time and effort and spend money to break, put this offering together to raise the money. Um, then uh, there is in crowdfunding, um, we commit fraud elsewhere, but not here. So we've seen very little fraud in the marketplace. So I think we need to go back to Washington and say, now's the time to increase the cap up to 20 million. And people ask me like, why the 20 million? Well, We've got these different exemptions that allow issuers to raise different amounts of money. Crowdfunding started at one, it's now at five. There's this other one called Regulation A. It's got two tiers in it. One, tier one allows you to raise up to $20 million. Tier two is up to $75 million. Tier one is relatively unused because it's qualified by each state. So you have to go to state by state and get each state to say, yes, you can raise money from investors in our state. I can't begin to tell you how bureaucratic, time consuming, and costly because every state's got their own registration and cost process for that. And people just don't, you know, want to deal with that. That since so regular the tier one has been relatively unused. But if there's if there was some need for that 20 million in tier one and it's not working, why don't we just take what is working and move the needle up to 20 million dollars there? and allow these issuers to do a very, very similar thing that's going on. Now, it's not a qualified offering, but this is a disclosure forward offering. And what is the SEC all about? What is it entirely built on? You know, there's two pillars, capital formation and disclosures. Um, and so, you know, if, let's help with the capital formation side. So uh, Avon, to your point, I think, you know, if we move that needle up to 20 million, It'll have a fundamental shift on these figures. I think the other thing that naturally is happening that we're seeing in the numbers is, you know, people are just getting engaged. But as soon as we start having some of these exits, and we're, we're working on our annual report right now, which is 120 page deep data dive into what happened in crowdfunding in 2023. Um, one of the things that I've done is I, you know, I reach out to the platforms to, to find out if there's been any notable exits in the space. Dealmaker, which has got, uh, you know, they're a broker dealer that facilitates these offerings. Um, and they've done Reg C, they've done Reg CF. They have two companies that are now listed this past year on the uh, NASDAQ. So they went public. Um, so, you know, in the annual report, we're going to dig into who those companies were, you know, what the investors that did their Reg CF round, which is probably one of the earliest rounds, paid price per share what they went public at um, and, you know, see how they perform since. But those type of stories, we have those stories of people investing in these companies and having the capital return to them that exit. I think the more awareness and the more we're going to see these numbers move up. Above. 
What do you I do? If think you had to ballpark it, what, what's the return for a Reg CF investor for those companies? Um. Oh. Um. I. I. I, I can't tell you because I just haven't done. I haven't dug into uh-huh. their price per share. Um. How they're currently trading. There's. You know. I guess there's a lot that needs the, to go the into. The core of the question is: Is it a significant enough return to attract attention? I mean, it should be. I mean, usually yeah. when you're doing your first run through, you know, crowdfunding, your price per share uh, that I see often is a dollar. Okay. Right. By the time they do multiple rounds, uh, you know, and by the time you go public, you know, your price per share has typically gone up significantly, uh, which is why you built a case for you to go public. Because when you're going public, you're sh- selling shares on a public market price. And investors should be interested in buying those shares, not because of the price is cheap, but because the company has shown promise. Um, and right. the reason they're paying a price related to that, what they've been able to deliver in the past. So, you know, we're not talking like one or two X, you know, I'm assuming that these type of the investments that these people have made have been, you know, a 20 X or a 30 X uh, by mm-hmm. the time it gets to public markets. Um, but, you know, stay tuned and I'll let you know. That's awesome. Yeah, I guess the 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 line there is important to find out. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Slide yeah. eleven. Built to come. Slide eleven. <laughs> okay. Um, let's talk about the uh, the number of investors or checks written into these offerings. Uh, there were twenty eight thousand nine hundred, almost thirty thousand checks written in December. This was up from November. So November was like a record month almost for capital commitments. It was like in, one of the eighth or ninth best on record. Um, December wasn't you know, that great, but there were more investors. So more people are coming in, they're writing smaller checks. Um, and this is up a lot over last year. Last year, there were only 14,700 at the same time. The average check for December did drop off from November. It was uh, 1,513. I think it was close to uh, 2,300 or so in November. Um, but these high check amounts have been trend, a trend for all of 2023. And just to put it in comparison, you know, when the industry got started in 2016, I think the average check size was $919. So what this means is people understand this opportunity. They're willing to risk more, twice as much as the, uh, you know, well, as the last month as, you know, than they were in 2016, um, but not a crazy amount. Like, you know, people aren't going to lose their entire investment if they take $1,500 on average and they put it into a deal and that deal goes south. Um, and I think that's also, you know, something that's great about investment crowdfunding is we've got these guardrails built into the system that keep people, you know, from risking more than they can afford to lose. That doesn't exist when you go to Vegas. I'll tell you that much. Um, so, um, and if we just look at that chart at the bottom, Again, in 2021, what happened? Well, that's when the SEC increased the cap from 1 million to 5 million. So, I, you know, you can imagine what would happen if we got the, uh, you know, Congress and the SEC through an amendment or something uh, to move that from 5 million to 20 million. The companies that rate, you know, in those months where we had about 70,000, 65,000 investors, those were some pretty um, well-established companies that had a broad network of investors that they had relationships with. Many of them were customers related to their business. Uh, and so they were able to raise money from them. I think that's the general story in the tech, you know, storyline that we see across the board. Um, we saw that drop off because of you know, the hyperinflation and all that in um, 2023. But now I think we're moving out of what's happening. And I think you know, the past few months are seeing more investors coming into the marketplace, writing more checks. Woody, we've been talking a lot about the potential of the SEC increasing the amount of money from $5 million to maybe $20 million. If you were to have to assign probability of it happening, what probability would you assign to it, let's just say, over the next three years? Um, well, the probability of the SEC doing something under the current administration is about, mm, let's see, 0.0%. <laughs> um, <laughs> the... Um, if, you know, here's the thing, this election cycle can have a, you know, a crowdfunding spin to it. You know, Mm -hmm. there's the, you know, if the, if the politicians really are concerned about jobs, like they say they are, 
if the politicians are really concerned about you know local economies and economic stimulus like they say they are um it doesn't matter if you're a republican or a democrat this this legislation and this law that was the most bipartisan piece of legislation to come out of congress the year that it passed is something that both sides should be saying what can we do to be creating more jobs? What can we do to be helping more entrepreneurs create more innovation in our country? Um, that's where the focus should be. So I think there's a way to, to engage people. And, and really that's what we did when we pushed this legislation through is we spoke to people about jobs, innovation, women and minorities, um, and we were able to do it that way. I think if things have become so polarized right now that it's things done, um, we lost a huge advocate too in Congress. Patrick McHenry, who was our chief champion for investment crowdfunding, he took our framework and turned it into the bill for which we did the lobbying for. Um, you know, he's he's retired, so he you know is no longer there, and so <clears throat> we've lost that champion in order to go to. Um, but hopefully, there's someone else in Congress, maybe yeah. someone's listening that is related to someone in Congress that understands this opportunity and can pick this up. Um, because Patrick McHenry saw the benefit of it, and I think it's delivered that. And I, you know, I think we can do more with relatively little risk. What do you, that's a great sell to lawmakers. What on the other side of it? What's your sell to an investor? You know, someone who is an average Joe. If you were an average Joe, let's say, you know, I want to get into crowdfunding. About it, step by step, to best set yourself up for success. Um, well, I think you need to, before you make any investments, and I think the right thing to do is, is make an investment just so you can go through the process. But I think before you do that, you have to look at these platforms and you have to look at the deals that are on them and read about them and understand, you know, what experience does the founder have in this space? Have they started a similar business before and have they had an exit before? You want to look for signals of success. Signals of success are, you know, they've raised capital. Signals of success is the experience that they have. If venture capital is in these deals, you know, it's it's tough to look at evaluation and see if it is a fair valuation, but that's where people like us come into place because we have all of the valuations and we can look at industry comps to see whether evaluation is in the same in the range where it should be. So investors need to look at, you know, the company, the founders. You know, the revenues, like, you know, I, I'm not opposed to investing in pre-revenue startups. It's just, you have to go into it with your eyes wide open and know like nobody's paid for anything yet. So we haven't actually proven that there's a market for this product or service. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's, you know, you have to put that hat on is would I buy this product or service? And if the answer to that is yes, then maybe you want to consider investing in that company. I love looking at the, the, the post-revenue issuers. And that's another thing that we do is, you know, we look at the data set and we look at for the signals of companies that are seeing revenue growth because we track revenue growth in their offerings from the initial filing through their annual report, um, through when they've done successive rounds of financing. So we track the revenue growth over time. And I think investors need to look at that. They need to look at cash. Cash is king. You know, you can't run a business without cash. I mean, that's mainly why companies are running business. But if a company is raising money and they only, and you know, they, they're you know, spending a million dollars a year and they only have $30,000 in the bank, according to, you know, the recent filing, you gotta be wondering like, what happens if you don't make it through the end of this filing period, you know, this fundraising period, are you still gonna be around? So, you know, you have to look at the, um, the quantitative stuff as well as the qualitative stuff when you're making it. Then, you know, of course, you know, there's ways in which if you just want to be diversified in the space, um, but you don't want to take the time and energy to invest in a single deal, you can look at how you can invest in funds. Um, so, you know, there's funds out there, you know, like, like I said, we've got one that invests in the broad spectrum of the deals in the marketplace after we do our own diligence in it. Um, but there's other ones too, you know, I, I think individual platforms have their own funds. So you can look at, you know, putting your money into one of those funds that will allow it to spread across 
um, multiple deals on that either platform or you know you know through um, fund other funds that are out there. Hey, hey, Woody. We can obviously uh, and. Uh... There's a little pitch here, but I think it's obvious. Uh, the other thing where you can shortcut all that uh, work is uh, obviously subscribing to some of our reports where basically, and we talked about it last time, right? One of the things is liquidity begets liquidity, right? So in the report, you can see what is running, right? What What is what is hot here? Who Who is buying what and where all the investors going? So there you can have a list of 10 of 20 most uh, successful offerings in the moment. And then you can already go and see, well, there's a reason why, you know, they probably are successful so you can cut your research already to these five or these 10 in these industries that you're interested in and 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 i think uh, you know save some substantial amount of time for doing your homework the other thing that i want to say is you may want to watch the uh, press release that we're gonna um post tomorrow um so i can't say what it's going to be but it's pretty close to something that uh, Woody was just talking about, and I think it's going to be helpful in 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 some of these assessments. So yeah, uh, again, watch watch this space. But tomorrow we're going to be announcing something that I think is going to be another um, uh, very helpful tool uh, to address some of the issues that that you know we discussed here and and some of the questions that you had. Yeah, I can't. I, I think that's great. You know, one of the reasons why we brought Avon on is we have all this data and we haven't packaged it in a way that allows you that's listening to this right now to actually use it to your benefit. And so, uh, you know, since Avon's been here, we've come up with a weekly tear sheet that's free that gives people updates as to what's happening. And then we've got these bi-weekly reports so you can see what's trends that are happening on a weekly, bi-weekly basis. A monthly report with this industry deep dive where we look at biotechnology and healthcare. Um, the next month is going to be blockchain. So it's an, a, a deep dive into blockchain and crowdfunding. Like, wow, like how many companies? Well, there's about 220 companies, I think it was. Wow. Um, that yeah. uh, have some sort of blockchain related offering. Um, and so we do a deep dive into the number of offerings, who the best, who the, you know, the top performers are. So if you get those reports, you know, that can streamline your investment decision or your, not your investment decision, but you can streamline your investment research um, mm -hmm. because it shows you who's raised the most money, who's got the most, you know, investors in the deal, um, it, you know, shows you the revenues and all that stuff. So they're interesting reports uh, and it takes the data and sort of makes it more actionable for people. All right. Okay, next slide. So valuations, medium valuations have really just been increasing over time. In, in December, oops, sorry about that. 46 equity offerings closed in December, not in November. Um, uh, the median valuation jumped to 20 million. Um, and the average amounts do based on whether how old they are and the, the revenue status. Um, what I wanna dig into on this is, you know, this is on par with what we're seeing happening in the, in the venture world. You know, we've seen early stage uh, companies really hold on to their high level valuations. You know, when the industry got started, it was 5 million median valuation. Um, so now I'll, I'll tell you right now that, you know, the, the outliers are really driving up the median valuation because we're getting more of these established issues in the marketplace. So even though the median's right in the middle, we're getting more of the people at the top and that's pushing everything up over time. But like I said earlier, you know, in, um, in December, the pre-revenue startups took the biggest hit and their median valuation fell to $9 million. Um, so the fact that the median valuation is up there at 20 million, it's on par with VCs. Um, I think that speaks as an opportunity for investors as well, um, because when you add up these valuations, that's where the, um, the you know, people, re the returns come from. So we want valuations to be going up, but we want them going up for issuers that are raising capital over time that are achieving their goals as well. Um, that's all I got on that one. Um, okay, so let's just quickly dive into some of these, um, you know, um, things that are happening with the platforms, economic value, and what's what it means to local economies. Um, like I've talked about this before, you know, we've got 150 platforms that I think have been registered with the SEC and FINRA. Um, but I don't know, people register uh, and spend a lot of money to register the platforms uh, with the SEC and do nothing. 
Um, so right now there were um, 24 platforms that facilitated offerings in December. Um, WeFunder had the most deals at 38, followed by Honeycomb, which is a debt platform at 31, and Start Engine at 14. WeFunder, um, they tend to be on the top a lot. They led in commitments at $19.5 million. Um, when we were talking about valuations on that last slide, and I was telling you about the cumulative amount of those valuations, well, that's what we call economic value. So we look at the companies that have raised money from their initial valuation through to their most recent valuation. If you look at the most recent valuation for successful issuers only, we don't really care about the ones that have failed because you know they're not going to have the exit. Um, they might, but not through crowdfunding. And no investors in crowdfunding are in them. Um, but the ones where we do have crowdfunding investors, their uh, their enterprise value is now seventy one point seven billion. And that's a billion with a B, not a million, but a wow. billion with a B dollars. So that is pent up money, pent up, literally, that will be returned to investors when these companies have exits. So a sale, a merger, an IPO, like we were talking about before, there are two companies that went public um, on the NASDAQ. So they're part of that $71.7 billion that has been returned to those investors. Um, you know, that's where we need to highlight that because you're not just throwing money away. You're making an investment with the hopes that it comes back to you. And I think more of the money that comes back to investors is more of the story that will lead to more people coming into the marketplace. The success rate for deals in December was 69.6%. That was down. It's typically around 75 or 80%. Um, but this is a tricky thing because I think issuers, um, I don't know if it's the issuers or the platforms, but they have these unrealistically low um, funding targets that don't represent what you really need money to do in order to achieve your milestones in a business. Um, so it's not that hard to hit that funding target and be successful. Um, so I like to point out, yes, we have a high success rate, but it is also with these unrealistically low, um, you know, um, funding targets that I'm, we're, I'm seeing go up over time. Um, and maybe there's some room in there uh, for us to improve that uh, as well as an in industry, um, you know, but, um, you know, success is success. And I like to talk about that. The average raise uh, was 787,000 in December. Um, you know, that's a number that just keeps on going up. You know, when the industry got started, you know, it was that million dollar cap. The average raise was about $250,000. So now we're at 787. Um, you know, that also moved up quite a bit when we moved from the $1 million to $5 million cap. Um, it also shows you that not all these companies are raising $5 million. You know, that's the average. So issuers that are listening to this right now thinking is crowdfunding right for me. Um, well, that's the average that people are raising. So if you need to raise $20 million, well, A, crowdfunding is not the right path for you because you can only raise $5 million for it. But, you know, if you want to raise $5 million, you need to think, can I realis realistically do that? Where am I going to be closer to the average in the marketplace? Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked about before is these debt deals. 40.5% of the deals are debt, but they only raise like 6% of the overall capital. You know, I, I, I don't quite know why so little money is going to these offerings when the yields are about 11.6%. Um, but the opportunities there, um, the debt deals, when you do dig into the data, it's a very different looking company than an equity type of offering. Many of these are mom and pop shops, um, sole proprietors, you, you know, your main street retail type of businesses. So they don't need, uh, you know, millions of dollars to run their operations. They need, you know, $50,000, $100,000 to achieve their goals. So that's what we're seeing there. But maybe, maybe the opportunity is more of these deals happening on more of these debt crowdfunding platforms like Mainvest, SMBX, Honeycomb, and that'll lead to more dollars that way. But I'll tell you that this is where the women and minority entrepreneurs are really benefiting because I, when we look at these debt offerings, um, I see a lot of women and minority entrepreneurs running these businesses. Um, so I think that's just a great area to focus on. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, how, how you can diversify into this space as well. I think there's a great story to be told about 
you know, I think Honeycomb is launching this, um, a fund on Honeycomb where you can invest in a broad a spectrum of their offerings on their platform. So it allows you to get this, you know, quite attractive return on investment or yield um, over time. And keep in mind, these aren't, you know, an equity investment is, it doesn't matter if it's crowdfunding or if it's venture capital, it's still seven to 10 years until you have the exit. Um, but these debt offerings are 36 months, okay? You know, they're, it's not very tremendously long um, offerings, or I would say the, not offerings, but it's not tremendously long um, periods for which they're doing the payback. It's, you know, on average 36 months. So, you know, there's a way in which you could be making you know, more than twice as much as you could put into a money market fund right now by diversifying into a broad basket of debt offerings on these crowdfunding platforms. And I think there's a whole story to be told right there. Um, when we look at what's happening with um, supporting local economies, I love to talk about this. Um, you know, you've heard me say it before. Um, these are not just businesses that are spending money uh, for, the, for the purpose of spending money. These are local businesses that are buying products and services from local vendors that are helping people pay for their mortgages in their local communities, buy groceries in their local communities. This is a cyclical process of you putting money into a business, that business using that money to grow that business through buying products and services, and then that money just circulates within the economy. Um, and it's, all, it's not happening necessarily in New York, San Francisco, and LA, it's happening here in Denver, it's happening in all these small cities around the country. Again, politicians, if you're listening, this is a talking point of why you should increase the cap to 20 million. Um, but you know, you can, it's pumping about $6.8 billion because we track all the financials, we can see that into these local economies. Imagine if this didn't exist, evaporation, that would be gone. Um, so, you know, this is an economic stimulus unlike we really have in many other parts of the country. And it's not one in which the government is throwing the money at the economy. You know, that's what the government did during COVID. They're like, here, everyone take a, you know, take a thousand dollars and go spend it. No, this is the government saying, okay, here's a framework for which issuers can raise capital for which companies can use that capital. And it's helping the economy grow. I mean, that's a phenomenal story. And you know what? Hey, here's a side effect of it. In December, it helped create and support 12,000 jobs. Okay, where else are we doing that? You That's know, great. So the cumulative amount of this is adding up to hundreds of thousands of jobs over time, particularly since we launched this. I think that is it's itself a reason why we should have more focused attention on this. Trust me, if the government wants to do something to support this, take a billion dollars, a small billion dollars, because they're throwing billions around left and right. And let's figure out how to take that billion dollars and leverage you know, what's happening within crowdfunding to invest in these businesses alongside Americans. That would then help this whole thing, you know, just blossom and skyrocket like we've never seen before. Um, okay, next. Woody, I got, a, I got a question about the platforms. When you look at the distribution of the platforms, are most of them in the United States and then the ones outside the United States, where are they located? So the platforms um, have to be, they don't have to be in the United States, but the majority of them are in the United States. The issuers themselves have to be domiciled, have a headquarters in the United States, but you can have a foreign issuer that creates a US entity to raise capital. So of the platforms, the vast majority of them are here. Dealmaker, which is a broker dealer, um, they're Canadian, um, but they're facilitating offerings here in the United States. So, their business is growing both in terms of the number of deals and the dollars that are being invested. Um, you know, but um, we've got, you know, it's not really happening necessarily with these uh, foreign platforms. Okay. What do you, what, All right. from a viewer that I think is an interesting one to bring right. up right now, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, so he, he said, um, his name is James Harbaugh. And he said, eight years into some of my investments, and still these companies seem to never want to exit and get their investors a return on investment. I want to reinvest in the crowdfunding, but it seems like I never get a return. He's suggesting there are more regulations pushing them to sell or IPO with, between eight to 10 years. I think retail investors of Reg CF and Reg A need to band together to push these companies 
that took our money to go public or sell or buy back shares. Uh, definitely a little bit more of a pessimistic look on what's been going on liquidity wise. Um, what do you, what do you think about what James is saying there? Well, James, we had a conversation in um, a couple senators' offices about this one. And in the bill, we put a 12-month holding period on these securities after which they are exempt and unrestricted and freely transferable. So that means that unlike many other securities where that you buy in a private company where you have to hold on to them, you can actually sell them on a, a secondary marketplace. Um, so there is the opportunity for you to potentially get some liquidity from your investments. You might not be able to get the value where it's currently trading because you want to you know, li liquidate your investment, but the, the, the potential is there and that doesn't exist elsewhere in the marketplace. So you can talk to the issuer itself about selling your shares on one of these, what they call alternative trading systems or secondary markets so you can get that liquidity. Um, but you do have a point, like when you're investing in these companies, you know, that's part of the research that you need to do. You know, one of the questions that we ask when we're doing diligence on companies is what is your exit strategy? You know, do you, do you even have one? You know, who are you, who's going to buy your business? Are you going to go public? When are you going to go public? What are the milestones related to that? Um, so it happens, you know, it even happens in, in venture capital. You know, I've, I invested in a venture capital firm um, and in their fund one, and they're now on fund five. And there are probably four or five investments from fund one, and it's 12 years later now um, that are still there. Um, so the dynamics don't change just because we've got investment crowdfunding. It's a reality for all of the you know, private capital markets. I do want to mention one of the pain points from talking to a lot of investors that I consistently hear is how sometimes they'll invest in the founders and then they won't hear any updates after they get their investment. And I think that's a big problem from the investor's perspective. And if there's a way, I don't know if it's somehow in placing more regulation to where they have to release mandatory yearly quarterly updates to invest or to update all the investors, but something where you can at least let the investor know so they feel like, okay, I know where my money is and I kind of can see some sort of roadmap and not just be left in the dark. Yeah, Connor. I mean, I wish I could get all, um, you know, issuers and these entrepreneurs to file their annual reports. Compliance with the annual reports is not the best thing. It's required by law. Uh, if, you, if you raise money through crowdfunding, you don't file your annual report and give that to your investors. The SEC could preclude you from ever using ever going out and raising money again. So there's major risks if you're not filing your annual report. Um, I, you know, entrepreneurs that, that are running these businesses, you know, I feel for them as well because you're focused on growing an enterprise. And so their head's down working on that. And, you know, they don't always want to be doing this, you know, reporting to investors. But, you know, I think what we need to get across them is, is you don't have to say too much. Mm -hmm. um, you can yep. literally write an email. And I see this, you know, with a lot of my investments. I love it. The, the, the simple, short, brief email. Hey, guys, 2023 was a great year or a bad year or whatever for us. Here are three things that really mm -hmm. were that stuck out in 2023. This is where our cash began at the, at the beginning of the year. And this is where it is right now. And this is where we spent our money. That's what people want to know. How much cash do you have? They want to know your revenues. How did they change? What were the customers? Maybe there were three customers that you want to highlight that drove the, you know, the changes in your revenues. And then they want to know what else has changed in your business, you know, from a spending perspective so that they could see, you know, how you're spending the money. And then you, want, you know what you want to do? You want to turn it around. It's not, I'm not reporting to you. This is how I need your help because the people yep. aren't necessarily looking for information. I mean, they are about how the company's performing. They really want to know how they can help you achieve your goals. So, you know, one, I love it when I get emails from companies I'd invested in where they're like, I need an introduction to a just-in-time inventory person that can help me redo my whole inventory thing. I need help. You know, a lot of it is we're going out for our next round of finance. We're not doing it through crowdfunding, but now we're actually going on to venture, you know, private right D offering. Can you introduce me to other investors? I, I did that this week as well for a company where I knew another uh, investor, a friend of mine would be interested in them. 
Um, so, you know, I think, you know, if I could tell all the entrepreneurs that are listening to this, don't be afraid. The, it, don't, don't be afraid of writing too little. <clears throat> writing something is better than nothing. Um, I, you know, I, I do, I, you know, I encourage people to do quarterly little emails um, rather than one annual one. The annual one's required, but if you do a quarterly one, you know what you're doing? You're building trust with your investors. Trust, transparency, communication. Those are all key in business. They're all key in our personal lives. Um, you know, it doesn't change. So people should be very focused on that as well, because if you have that trust, it'll help grow your business later on. And it'll also keep you from getting in trouble, um, you know, by not doing things that you're supposed to do with the SEC. I think that's a great point, especially with just like you could send that email with less than 750 words total. Completely. It's, yes. So, yeah. yeah, great point. Great point. Okay. So just a couple of a few more slides that I want to talk about, you know, where we've come from. I, I aggregated these based on year by year. Again, these are the commitments that we've had, 547 million. I'm expecting 2024 to be closer to 625 million. So more capital I expect to come into the marketplace. Um, the next slide is going to talk about um, the number of deals. You know, we had a drop off in 2023. I think it's really going to change in 2024 and it's going to be a lot greater. It's probably going to be the best year for deals that we've had to date. And so I'm expecting there to be about 1,800 um, deals uh, in 2024. And then the next slide, um, uh, we've got uh, checks written. So this is an interesting one. I thought this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. You know, in 2021, I was telling you we had the one to five million shift, which brought in a lot of investors. 2022 and 2023 that just ended essentially had the identical number of investors in it. I, I thought this was fascinating how it ended out. So that threw off the forecasting model in our in our software that, that does all this um, because it weighs heavily on what's happening in the, in the prior two years, uh, the formula does. And so it's still saying that, you know, 2024 is gonna have, you know, about 313,000 investors. I think that is, you know, we'll see how it all plays out. You know, if there's a big hit and a big media story, we'll have more investors. If they, you know, if, you know, somehow the, in, the cat moves upwards, we'll have more investors. Um, if the economy, you know, goes into a recession, we'll probably have less investors. Um, you know, those are all things that are going to drive it. But, you know, I think it's just interesting to look at the trend that's been happening over time. We've sort of been in this stagnant place right here, but I believe we'll be going up from there. And then next slide. Yeah, there you go. That's my pitch. No, just <laughs> just finishing off here, just re reminding um, uh, people who are watching this um, either live or afterwards the recording. So we we are producing more and more resources to help the industry. Right. So as uh, Woody mentioned, we have the free weekly tier sheet, which is the, the piece on the on the left here. Um, which you can download and we send an update obviously every week that's on the Monday mornings. Uh, but then we also started publishing uh, reports that you can subscribe to. So we have a uh, bi-weekly, which is sort of a data heavy uh, overview of what happened you know, over the last two weeks. And I said with this top 10, you know, hottest offerings and where you really sort of can cut to the chase quite quickly. Um, we also published a monthly report which is uh, uh, an extended version of the bi-weekly, but more importantly also, it has a, uh, a sector focus. Um, we're gonna publish the, the third edition um, in, in the next few days actually, but the first issue was uh, around life sciences where we then interview an executive and we highlight a company and really talk about uh, how that industry has been doing over the years. Um, the second month uh, or the second uh, edition uh, was uh, with uh, beverages. Again, same issue, uh, but I'm most excited about the one that we're going to publish in the next few days because it's going to be focused on blockchain and crypto related, um, you know, companies. And, and as Woody also indicated, we have like more than 200 of them, which is, I think, quite surprising and amazing. 
especially at a time now, I think should be interesting. Uh, now that we see the whole sort of crypto space explode again, mm -hmm. and 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 getting uh, getting interest. So I think for people who want to look for exposure in a private company, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to go to Coinbase. You can maybe look at crowdfunding and see if you can. Uh, you know, pick some uh, uh, great companies that have exposure in some shape or form to to that sector. I think that's that's quite interesting. And I wasn't aware at all that there were so many companies uh, in in that space. Um, you can find all these reports on the uh, the website. So we have a, a Gumroad website where all the reports are available. And most importantly, uh, we'll have many more products and services coming up actually in the next couple of weeks and months. But um, as I indicated before, tomorrow there will be a press release regarding a new service that we're launching. And I think will be uh, especially helpful for uh, maybe more the sort of institutional side of the business. We have quite a bit of people um, who want to deep dive on a lot of the work that we've been doing. So look out for that announcement. And then obviously we're, we're finishing the works on our annual report that we'll be publishing also in different uh, you know, uh, shapes and forms with and without the, the, the separate data set. But I think all, all in all, we, we continue to uh, produce information uh, in different shapes and forms, uh, both free and uh, uh, by subscription. And I think that that will all only help you know, the further growth of the industry. And obviously we're, we're open to suggestions on how we can even you know, improve on what we're doing today. And and launching uh, more products and services as we as we go through the year. But you know, uh, as a wrap up, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I think I think we're going to have a phenomenal year in the industry in 24. I think we're going to have a lot of positive surprises in 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 sort of the economic growth backdrop. Um, you know, typically uh, a presidential year is is always good for markets uh, and for the economy as well. Um, and they're gonna probably throw a couple of more trillion dollars in there to make sure that happens. Uh, but I think that will also um, reflect positively on further growth uh, for the industry. So again, uh, on my end, uh, extremely excited what we have coming both for the firm, um, for our different entities, but for the industry just in general. So uh, thank you guys for having us on. I think this is an important conversation that we're happy to contribute to and and yeah looking forward to uh, continue to gain engage with the with the community yeah and yeah. i think uh i think it's it's always important the more data you have the better decisions you can make so that's always kind of the most important thing and to search through all the data yourself with each individual startup it's i don't want to say a waste of time but the amount of deals you can actually go through is super minimal so yeah. to be able to have it all in one report it saves a lot of time and it also helps you make a much better decision when it comes to investing. I'd like to hear you so, say it, <laughs> um, bef Before y'all go real quick, since it is 2024, uh, we'll just do round table. Your one big prediction for the crowdfunding industry in 2024. We'll start with you, Woody. What is your one big bold prediction for 2024? Um, my big Bold prediction for 2024 is that I mean I, I I think that you know we've had some of these IPOs, but we haven't had the IPO that gets the media attention. And I think with 6,800 companies now that have raised capital, one of them is going to be the Mega Millions. Um, winner that makes uh, a bunch of Americans millionaires. Um, and it could be one of these ones out of this, you know, blockchain thing uh, that we're working on right now. Um, but, I, you know, it's an, it's not, it's, it's, it's a matter of time. It's, you know, it's mm -hmm. not if it's going to happen, it's when is it going to happen? And I think we're there, you know, I think, you know, 2016 was what, seven, eight years ago. Okay. Now we're in that window. We're in that window of exits. So let's start making some money. And I think this is with a year of, of making money. Yep. It's like a ticking time bomb, but with a jackpot underneath it. <laughs> so what about you, Yvonne? What's your big, bold prediction for 2024 for the crowdfunding industry? Well, thanks for taking me second so I had some time to think because it's uh, what I'm, <laughs> it was unexpected here. <laughs> <laughs> um I think uh, two uh, two things. I think we're going to have a um, 
a new champion in Congress um, after the elections. Um, that's one. Uh, second, I think uh, Boxable will go public um, at a uh, phenomenal valuation and will continue to, um, you know, do extremely well in the meantime. So, yeah. That's great. What about you, Brendan? Your big, bold prediction for 2024. I wouldn't say mine's a bold prediction, but my mine kind of borders on the hope. But um, I really think there's going to be a meaningful push into these local economies and small businesses. I think that the predictions of the IPOs and I, I do think that it's incredibly highly possible that one of those ends up happening soon. I don't know if it'll be this year it may be the year after, but I really um, that there's going to be a meaningful push in these uh, smaller towns with people getting funding. You know, you're going to start to see a lot of entrepreneurship, a lot more entrepreneurship continue in cities like Atlanta and Denver and, you know, cities that are not Silicon Valley, but I think you're going to see entrepreneurship. Let me say it this way. Entrepreneurship, not of a Silicon Valley thing. It'll always be a Silicon Valley thing, but you're going to see the other cities really skyrocket uh, with entrepreneurs. And I think crowdfunding is really going to help that. Yep. And I, I think those are the big media stories, right? We talk about IPOs, but really seeing the impact and getting more media coverage on the impact crowdfunding has on these local economies. That's what gets a lot of people happy because they know, oh, the average everyday person can also become an entrepreneur, raise money, have a successful business, be able to provide for their family, provide jobs for, you know, the local economy. Yeah, I think that's a uh, as we show, saw from the stats, there's a, there's a lot of growth in those small towns, smaller economies. And I guess for me, my bold prediction for 2024, I think WeFunder is going to uh, is gonna take first place from Start Engine when it comes to amount of money raised for equity uh, crowdfunding. I think WeFunder is going to finish first, and then Start Engine is going to finish second, 2024. So that's my prediction. But Love it. Woody, right. Yvonne. See. Thank you for coming on. We appreciate y'all. Um, for all the listeners out there, check out cclear.gumroad.com. Check out the insight, get the data, uh, especially get the data if you're thinking about making investments. You know, data helps you make the best, best informative decision possible. And that's probably the number one thing to do before making these investments. So, Wadi and Yvonne, thank you for coming on. For all the listeners out there, we appreciate y'all. Happy New Year. And we'll see you next time on next big thing hq wonderful thank, thank you guys. guys thank you everyone bye bye bye, bye, bye. all right we are off air there we go thank you woody sure thing guys we're going forward to the next one is, is there anything that um